Hello ladies and gents, I broke my mic stand, so just bear with me for this video as I'm manually holding my mic. At the end of 2021, my frustration with SSO finally exceeded my love for Jorvik and its lore. I started playing less and less until at last I was no longer an active player and I pretty much only logged on if I had something to film for a video. It reached a point where I hadn't done a single quest in like two years until recently when I realized that it's probably about time to catch up. So that's what I did. And in this video, I want to give my little review of how I feel like the game is doing now, where it's heading and how it compares to the last time that I was an active, engaged player, which is two years ago now. <laughs> I was initially thinking that this was gonna be like a quick game review, but I realized after writing down my notes for the script that this video is probably gonna be very long. So I wanna just jump right into it and I wanna start off with really quick the new UI. My first impression of the new UI was that it's very simple and minimalistic, which can be interpreted as both good and bad. On one hand, it's very clean looking, but on the other, it gives off mobile vibes. Personally, I got used to the new UI surprisingly fast, and after that, I didn't really mind it. It's hard for me to say if I prefer it over the old one, because while this one was more clean and modern, the old one had more personality and felt more unique to SSO. But I think that in the grand scheme of things, this update was really not that bad, and since I got used to it so fast, I would give it an 8 out of 10. When it comes to the new player character, a lot of players seem to really enjoy this character once they saw it in the game and got used to it very fast. Uh, yeah, that didn't happen to me. The clothes don't fit right, crop tops look bad, jeans are low-waisted, shoulders are too narrow, everything is saggy and it's making my character look like a stump little grandma. The head is too big for the body, which becomes extra apparent when we're standing next to an NPC. I mean, I like that we're taller now, but we don't look tall, we just look big and disproportionate. I gotta be honest and say that I don't like how my character looks, and sadly, it didn't improve much as I played. Personally, I ended up choosing the first body, which, as it turns out, around 80% of players do. That in itself is a pretty bad sign. I mean, the update is supposed to diversify the game, but when 80% of players choose the same out of 6 bodies, it's not a very diverse experience, and it may even lead to players bullying those 20% who choose differently. The goal should be to spread out people's choices so that we see the variety while riding about, and so that one body doesn't become the standard. So what should have been done differently? Well, first off, what applies to all of them is that they should have wider shoulders, higher breasts and a smaller head. That would help even out the proportions and make the characters look more like actual human teenagers. When it comes to the variety of the choice though, the issue seems to be with the three smallest body options, because the bigger three seem to have fairly nice variety. I've heard many claim that the skinniest body is not skinny. I think what people actually mean by this is that the proportions are off. I've noticed that when you compare the body to other bodies, the weight seemed to be removed from the outside of the thighs rather than the inside, and hence making the body very square. I think the reason for this is that they're terrified of giving our character a thigh gap, because that's traditionally been considered a dangerous beauty standard. But the reality is that a majority of skinny people do have thigh gaps, and a body type that is supposed to be smaller than average should therefore also have a thigh gap by default. Because being skinny doesn't change your bone structure. But okay, you know what? Since SSE is concerned about beauty standards, and since the goal here is to diversify the bodies, I would keep this body preset flat for argument's sake. I mean, I've been very pro-male characters, and I'm happy to see some flatter and more masculine options, so I personally don't feel like they all need to have a defined chest. However, that brings me to the second body. This, in my opinion, should be a more feminine looking body, with a bigger chest area and a more prominent hourglass shape. The main complaint that I've seen about the body types is the lack of smaller curvy options, or smaller bodies with chests at all, because all three of the smallest ones are flat. Again, I'm glad that we have some flatter options, but I really think a lot of people would want to choose the second body of the first body if only it had more of an hourglass shape. And then there's the third body, which is the buff one. I don't know about you, but this body just never looked buff to me. I know they talked about adding muscle definition later, but to me, this has more to do with the shape than the texture. I would like for this body to be leaner, with a wide chest and shoulder area, and a slimmer waist and hips. This would make the character look stronger and different from the others. 
It would also be more masculine leaning, which is a great option for players who identify with that, or those who simply want a tough looking character. As a result, I'm sure that this body would also increase in popularity. Even though I think that the first two would still be more popular, we would at the very least spread it out a little more and prevent everyone from choosing the same body. Having a more distinct selection right off the bat would definitely contribute to a more diverse game experience, so if it was up to me, the three smallest body presets would look like this. Overall, I would say that the character update is premature, and that they should have waited until the end of the year or so before rolling it out. And this may be an unpopular opinion, but with how they are right now, I would actually prefer the old crusty ones. It may have the proportions of a Barbie doll and graphics from the early 2000s, but at least back then I felt like the character was rocking her outfit. And besides, we've had that character for 12 years. It's not like we couldn't wait another 6 months for the new ones to be done properly. I will say though, I noticed during the birthday event that they had a survey about this in the game, so I take that as a positive sign that they're already working on more options, which is something that I'm looking forward to. While that doesn't excuse the current state of the characters or change how I feel about them now, I do think I'm gonna like them better once they have more body options and customization. As of now though, I'll rate them a 5 out of 10. When it comes to questing, I do want to divide this into two different categories because I have a lot of different things to comment on both of them. For the lore and story part, I love to see the amount of old lore and references. Herman and his brothers were mentioned a couple of times and even referenced as the Wettons, so this is confirming their existence and Herman's last name being Wetton. Like, I've wanted them to mention this for such a long time to kind of confirm that it's still canon and now it is. I also really enjoyed the Jorvik cassette quest, even though I do wish that we got to hear the full stories and not just fractions of them. We also finally got an interaction with Miss Rita at Aideen's Plaza, which she's been there for a long time, but it's always been more of an easter egg. Her dialogue even included a Eurovision reference. My man Karya is conquering the world here. Anyway, in the same quest we also got to see Alex's childhood home, which, if I'm gonna be nitpicky, it's originally located in a poor city neighborhood called Krauss Nest, but technically we could argue that Krauss Nest is a part of Governor's Fall. And comparing the maps, I was surprised to discover that this could actually work out location-wise. So even though I would have preferred Krauss Nest to be its own city location, Alex's childhood home being in Governor's Fall works out surprisingly well. Now we can start speculating on which buildings Kevin and Raptor live in. And it has to be mentioned, there's always side quests that are boring and even just fillers, but the general expectation for side quests are lower for that reason. I had a great time doing these quests anyway and was pleasantly surprised by the amount of lore and references, so this is a big plus for me. For the main story though, my opinions are a little bit more mixed. I do realize that the story is turning darker, more things are happening, it's getting more exciting and we are approaching the climax of the story it seems. I like it in that sense. I think the main issues that I have with the main story right now is how different it feels from the original, which at this point is a me problem because I just have to realize that the story is a completely different thing now. It's way more magical and not so much reality with the twist, which it was before, uh, and it's more fantasy and magic based than it is sci-fi. That's just something I have to deal with, that it's very different now, it's not the same story and if I don't like it, I will just have to write my own version of the SSO story. But I feel like a lot of the more magical aspects that have been added kind of takes away from the Soul Riders and make them feel less special. Because there are so many people with magical abilities now, there are so many different creatures, there are talking horses, there are glowing runes all over the place, the whole island knows about the legend. What's so special about the Soul Riders at this point? And I realize I... I even have this problem with grasping what the new story is, because they can't seem to make their minds up about it. What I'm referring to here is the constant introduction of new lore and characters and how detached they feel from the rest of the world. It's kind of like the talking horses in Wildwoods, which is a whole controversy on its own because of how unnecessary it is. Yeah, I got the same kind of vibe when interacting with Beatrix. Mrs. Holdsworth's adoptive grandchild, who's a magic talking goblin hiding away in the fourth Mario library, reading books. Or when I saw that the Vela has pretty hair and shiny antlers, instead of looking like a terrifying old witch. The wild weave was also pretty strange to me, like, 
why do we need all these weird ways to create portals to different places when we have a literal portal maker among us? I mean, technically speaking, we have two. And I know that it was explained in the quest why we had to do this, why the wild wheat was important, we had to regrow the tree instead of just walking into Devil's Gap, but the whole thing just feels so improvised and out of place. Like honestly, with all these different ways to create portals to different places, it's weird we didn't get to Pandora sooner. And okay, I know I'm being harsh here, because of nostalgia and because of me not understanding the new story as well as I did the old one. I mean, the story is getting darker, more things are at stake than before, we have all the Soul Riders, the Dark Riders are finally reunited and trying to fight us, something's finally happening in the story. And it's not all that bad, it's really not. It's just this weird vibe that I'm getting from it that makes it feel more detached from the rest of the world. Kind of like they're making up things as they go instead of building upon what they already have. So I think that I would rate the main story somewhere between 6 and 7 out of 10. But including the side quests, I would bump it up to a solid 8. So it's not really that bad. I'll keep the gameplay aspect of things very short, but the reason why I wanted to include this in a separate category is because I've noticed a shift in how you progress in quests. One thing is that we're suddenly receiving a lot of XP from both main and side quests. This is something we've been asking for for years, because that lousy 5 to 10 XP reward we've been given for the past few years have been nothing but annoying and grindy. Now we're finally receiving XP like never before, and it's so much more motivating. I mean, I went from level 21 to 24 in no time while catching up, something that would have taken years and years with the usual amount of XP. Apparently, the reason for this is that the stats have been capped at level 26, and the maximum level is set to level 30. I think this is a really good call, because it will reward those who put in the work, but it won't put new players at a disadvantage. I much prefer this system because it is so much more rewarding to do quests. Secondly, and more importantly, I've noticed that the quests have become more challenging, in the sense that they require you to think more and solve various puzzles. When we used to be told go fetch that and come back, we are now told to use our heads and figure out what to do next. We solve riddles and puzzles, we take on challenges on horseback, and we use existing gameplay mechanics to work our way towards our goal. This is a development that I was not expecting at all, but I'm so here for it, cause questing has never been more fun, and I was left with a feeling that I actually accomplished something. So the way that gameplay is looking right now, I'd rate this a 10 out of 10 development. I did also make a new account to play through the new starter quests, and there are things that I like and things that I don't like. The new riding camp area is honestly amazing, and I love that non-star riders finally have another area to play in, because they've literally never had that outside of events. And also, I really, really love the dream scene, because it adds a layer of foreshadowing that perfectly fits with the story. We, as the fifth Soul Rider, are supposed to have all four of the Soul Rider powers, and this dream scene would be our moon powers waking to life. For the most part of the story, we only show off our Soul Strike or Lightning power, and we also manifested our Sun Circle powers when saving Justin. With the addition of this dream, we are now only missing the Star Circle. So in my opinion, this is the perfect way to introduce new players to the main story without necessarily changing anything. But the new starter quests also come with the introduction of all four Soul Riders. Now I do understand why they did this, but this just feels very forced to me. It's not just the fact that we meet the Soul Riders right off the bat and they have to change everything so that they go missing right after we meet them, but the dialogue! Do they have to make it so painfully obvious that they're special? I cringed so hard reading the quests because they're blurting out their secrets within two seconds of meeting us and then pretending it's nothing. It's not leaving any room for imagination and it's just completely unrealistic. The whole Soul Rider deal is supposed to be a secret and this is how they handle it? Honestly, this just makes them seem very unreliable and irresponsible as Soul Riders and teammates and whatever. And besides, it always felt more natural how the girls were missing before we arrived. It gave us a gradual introduction to each and every one of them, and it added mystery to the whole thing. Like, it made us ask questions and uncover mysteries along the way instead of having it shoved in our face. 
So yeah, big plus for the new riding cap area and big plus for the dream, but not a fan of the new quests. It's a 5 out of 10. And then we come to the section where I start discussing new and updated NPCs, which is gonna be a long section, so settle up and get ready. This is gonna be a lot of different opinions. <laughs> so I wanna start off with the Dark Riders, which have been shown to us before, but we haven't seen them in-game until recently-ish. Starting with Sabine, Sabine is the Dark Rider that has grown on me the most. When I first saw her, I was overwhelmed by how different she looked and the vibe she gave off. Cause by the looks of it, classy rich equestrian Sabine had been turned into a big macho motorcycle girl. Which is the complete opposite of what everyone expected from Sabine. There were also other changes to her appearance that made her not look like herself, like her hair going from short and bushy to long and slick, or her purple eyes turning bright orange. I still do have a problem with how inconsistent the design is to the original, but there's been a lot of content with her in the game since then, and I've gotta say that at the very least, I'm surprised about her personality. The new Sabine has a lot of anger and jealousy that she can't hold back, which sometimes does give me the same vibe as the petty snob she used to be. The equestrian part of her personality is also shining through more than what I would expect given the design. And if we were to take the old one out of the equation for a moment, I do find her to be well executed as a character. So honestly, even though it's clearly very different from the original, and I would have liked her to stay more consistent to the class and femininity she had before, it's not as bad as I initially feared. So does this mean that I accept this as a solid update to Sabine's character now? Not really. <laughs> However, I will give credit where credit is due, and she has been bumped up to an initial like 4 out of 10 to a solid 6 out of 10. So an improvement, definitely. Next I want to talk about Katja, which unfortunately has had the opposite effect on me as Sabine. When I first saw concept art, I could still imagine her having her old sassy personality. I was later very surprised to see just how small and colorless her model looked, but it was still similar to the concept art and she still had some of her core traits in appearance, so I still latched onto the hope that she would be somewhat similar to the original. But after catching up and getting to know her in game, I'm sad to say that my initial impression was wrong and I don't like this Katya half as much as I hoped I would. And it's not necessarily because she's different, but more so because I don't think that her character was executed well. I think initially, Katya could have rocked the cold, creepy embodiment of death thing, like for example if she was split and mad and enjoyed playing with her prey. But no, the girl's whole personality is a depression and it feels a bit excessive to me. It's like they're trying too hard to make her out to be this sad, tragic character, and by doing so, they're removing any and all trace of color, emotions, and personality, and we're left with a shell of a character whose only purpose is to be sad. The sass she had before is gone, as is the dedication towards Dark Horse cause and the fighter instinct when coming face to face with the Soul Rider. They could have done so much more with this character, and for a long time I thought they were going down the Ice Witch path, in which she would be the fearless Ice Witch of Ice Dell and Queen of the Cultures, a conqueror with a heart of ice. But I can't imagine this character being anything of the sort. I'm sorry girl, but you're not getting more than a 5 out of 10 for me. When it comes to Jessica, I wasn't very impressed with this update to begin with, because she didn't resemble the original at all. They initially changed her name to Jay, which they later reverted back to Jessica, thank god. Her ponytail was replaced with short hair, her heels in black leather was replaced with uh, whatever kind of attire this is. And I'm going to address the elephant in the room. They did race swap her. It's not like skin color has any relevance to her character or personality, and it's not like we knew her exact race to begin with. But come on, let's be real here for a moment. For being an update to an existing character, she sure changed a lot. But okay, let's move away from her visual update and let's talk about her personality. I was trying to search for signs of her original character traits, and what I do like is how she keeps her head high with confidence. But that's pretty much the only thing that was recognizable about her, in my opinion. Besides her eyes, which I'm almost surprised they didn't change given how different everything else is. But that's pretty much it. 
I struggle to even figure out what her personality is in this version, because it all seems very shallow. Star Stable Entertainment initially described her character as the dark writer that makes everything she does seem effortless. Which to me makes it sound like they couldn't really come up with anything personal to describe her. I know we haven't exactly had a lot of quests with her yet, but so far I'm not very impressed with Jessica's new character, regardless of whether or not we compare it to the original. I'm sorry girl, but you're unrecognizable and shallow, so I'll only give you a 3 out of 10. Don't freak out, it gets better from here, I swear. Because <laughs> the next characters that got updated was Big Bonnie, the Baroness and Mrs. Holsworth. The Baroness, in my opinion, got a really strong update, where they hardly changed anything at all. She very much resembled the old version in terms of hairstyle and color palette, even down to the makeup being the same. Her old Victorian dress has been replaced with a classy old lady attire and a purse, which, even though I kind of like the Victoria vibe, the new outfit suits her very well. I do get the impression that her personality is somewhat sweeter, but it's hard to tell because she's never been a major character to begin with and didn't really have that fleshed out of a personality. But I really do like and approve of this update and I'll give it a 9 out of 10. When it comes to Big Bunny, this is probably the character that has changed the least between the versions, and she is so well executed. You get all the little details on her outfit, the texture on her skin, and fresh new animations, all while sticking to the old familiar design that we all know and love. This is the perfect example of how to stay true to the original when updating a character. She's perfect and I'm here for it, it's a solid 10 out of 10. Out of the trio that was updated together, Mrs. Holsworth was the one that changed the most. She used to be this stubby old woman hunched over a walking stick, and the update made her look much younger, taller and skinnier. I did read that this is because they found a way to reuse a model with different facial structures, and that Mrs. Holtzworth uses the same model as Big Bunny and the Baroness, hence why the three of them were updated together. I think this is a very smart and effective way to update and create unique characters, without having to sculpt their models from scratch, and it does make me understand why Mrs. Holtzworth looks the way she looks. Regardless, as far as updates go, I do think she falls a little bit short, at least compared to the Baroness and Big Bunny, who fit the model so much better. But let me be clear, she's in no way a bad update though. She's cute and I like how they kept their sweet old personality. So she still gets an 8 out of 10. Next we gotta talk about Concord and oh boy. <laughs> We've seen Concord's transformation coming for a while and I'm sure I'm not the only one who felt very anxious about how she'd turn out. After all, they already went out of the way to gender swap her, and the other guardian horses went through quite a few changes themselves. Adult Concord was even featured in the Dark Song comic, where she was shown with a long, unkept mane and tail, and so naturally, I assumed that that design was what we were gonna see in the game, for her adult form. Well, imagine my surprise when she came out looking exactly like the original. I kid you not, I got emotional seeing her, because it truly felt like the old Concord had returned to us, and I thought that version was gone for good. So while Concord's gender is still swapped, I'm so thrilled with how the original design was brought back, that I'm not hesitating in giving this update a top rating. And that may make it sound like it's solely for nostalgia, but no, Concord is a dressage horse, the classy one out of the Guardian Horses, who perfectly mirrors Anne, like true soulmates do. I'm beyond thrilled to see this iconic duo back together, so without a doubt, Concord gets a 10 out of 10. Next we have Justin Moreland, who got a visual update not too long ago. I generally like this update because he's very recognizable and they didn't stray too far from the previous designs. His new outfit makes sense considering he runs a stable with his dad, and I do like how they added some small beer stubs to his face, because he is supposed to be older. However, if I'm gonna be nitpicky, I'd say that the biggest flaw in this new design is that he doesn't look as handsome and dreamy as the game makes him out to be. You know what I'm talking about. Loretta has an unhealthy obsession with him, Alex had a crush on him in the old canon, the description for Justin's jacket says it still smells like him. Yeah, the game definitely does set him up to be this handsome older guy who everyone has a crush on. And I don't think the new design lives up to that image. 
His build is less macho, he's got puppy eyes, and I know I said his outfit makes sense, but let's be honest, it doesn't give off the same pretty boy vibes as the tucked shirt. He just looks so much softer in this version, and I can't imagine what he looks like when he joins Dark Horse. I don't know if there is another version for that, like we've had with him previously, but there's nothing dark and mysterious about this puppy face, and I'm not sure I'd take him seriously in his Dark Rider face. But again, on a greater scale, that's just nitpicking. He's very recognizable, and if you compare him to some of the other characters that's been updated, he's clearly one of the better ones. I guess I'll give him an 8.5 out of 10. We also recently got one new character added to the game, which is the fourth Dark Rider, Erissa. And she has not had any dialogue in the game and she just arrived, so I won't really be judging anything from her personality because we don't really know anything yet. So this review will basically just review the vibes that her character gives off, I guess. If you remember my video from two years ago, I was very, very critical about Chio's design because she was a colorful child. Uh, she embodied every Asian stereotype there is, and I couldn't really imagine her being a dark rider. I do think that Erisa is definitely an upgrade from Chio because she doesn't embody all the Asian stereotypes anymore, she's not as colorful, and she does look a little bit older in my eyes. I do still have some problems with the fact that she's a child and I have some problem imagining her in that role. However, looking back, I do think that this was actually hinted without us realizing. Like for example, a couple of years ago in the Haunted Trail ride, there was this quote from Garnock's spirit saying that the lost child will shepherd the others back to my will. At the time, everyone kind of just assumed that the lost child was us and that we were gonna shepherd the others back to uh, Garnock's will. But now, knowing what we know about Erisa, the last Dark Rider, it makes more sense that it is the fourth Dark Rider he was talking about and not us. There was also the whole Dark Rider of Chaos thing. I guess that makes sense with a child. So I'm open to the possibility of it working out, but I'm very skeptical and I'm struggling to imagining this looking good, and I'm struggling to imagine us fighting a child with a hobby horse, if you get what I mean. I just generally have a lot of questions about the design and how this is gonna be executed, uh, but I'm open to the possibility that they can pull it off. I just don't really believe they will. <laughs> so judging from what we've seen so far from Erisa, I think I would give her a 6 out of 10 as a character, but that is very subject to change because, like I said, we haven't seen her in the game yet. We don't really know how her character is gonna pan out. So I guess we will see eventually whether or not my rating will move. But initially, it's a 6 out of 10. She's really not what I expected, but you can't always get what you want, can you? Okay, we're moving on to new and updated areas, and I want to start off with Marley's farm. Which came out just as my SSO days were cooling off, and I was so happy to see how similar it was to the old one. They kept the same familiar layout and feel, but gave the place a beautiful visual refresh, and it felt like a breath of fresh air after the backlash that followed Silverblade Village and Steve's, because people were not happy with those updates. Marley's farm, on the other hand, perfect. This, in my opinion, is exactly how an updated area should look by default. No excessive changes, just a refreshing and safe approach to a well-established area. 10 out of 10. The thing with the Baroness's racetrack is that there wasn't really a lot to begin with, so it's hard to compare the versions and rate it as an update. The story behind the racetrack is that it was trashed after GED started drilling for oil in the area, and the Baroness has wanted to have it fixed ever since. Given this context, I would have liked the broken version to have more industrial elements instead of looking so overgrown. The fixed version looks like an actual classy racetrack, but some aspect personally remind me a little bit too much of a ranch. I can't really tell if that's me being clueless about how horse racing and racetracks work in real life, but this update is nonetheless a good improvement in my opinion. It's certainly different, but with the little context we have, I'd say it fits fairly well, and I'll give it an 8 out of 10. Now, Devil's Gap is a very interesting one, because while it is a new area in SSO, it has appeared in previous games. 
the two versions that we've seen before are not identical to one another, so the only defining trait between them is that it's a steep passageway, combined with a vague backstory of witches and dark magic. And let me tell you, for the most part, this new version of Dallas Gap lives up to those expectations. It's most certainly a steep passage, gives off a dark and ominous feeling, and I'm pleasantly surprised by how familiar it feels. The only thing that doesn't make this place a solid 10 out of 10 is that it feels like they went a tad bit overboard with the magic aspect of things. Yes, Devil's Gap was always portrayed as some kind of witch's lair, but that begs for some cauldron swamp type of magic. Not glowing butterflies and pretty girls with shiny antlers. You get what I mean? Yeah, I do realize that I have some personal beef with how magic the new main story is and the veil and everything that I can't quite get over. But the overly fairy tale feel is really the only thing that pulls this place down, because otherwise, I do think it's a really nice fresh take on an old classic. It's a 9 out of 10 for this one. Next we have Hollow Woods, and oh boy, do I have a lot to say here. <laughs> People were very nervous about the Hollow Woods update, because they were afraid that it would be turned into another Wild Woods, which is a rather controversial area to begin with. The general concern in the community was that they would go overboard with the magic aspect of things and make the place look way too bright and colorful, which wouldn't suit the theme of it, or the name for that matter. The original Hollow Woods felt very dark and abandoned with a lingering hint of mystery behind it, and I'm happy to say that the update has not only kept that same feeling, but actually added to it. The color combinations make it look so visually pleasing yet familiar. The fog, the bluish-grey hue, the dead tree trunks, the lighting, the abandoned summer house, and other abandoned ruins, for that matter. It's all looking so good, and it has suddenly become a place where you will definitely get lost, for better and for worse. Hence living up to the name, Hollow Woods. The added soundtrack fits perfectly into the environment too, and makes you feel truly lost in the woods. This is the exact vibe I was hoping to see. And I'm not the only one positively surprised, the community has hardly ever been this pleased with an update. I have to admit, I was kind of scared that the second and third update with the paths would feel excessive and kind of kill the newly established vibe, because I was so pleased with the initial update that I thought that nothing they added could improve it. But gameplay-wise, I am in love with the paths. This is hands down the best, most immersive thing they've added to the game. It's hours and hours worth of content without feeling grindy, because we are put in charge of the progression. We choose our own path, set our own pace, and define our own journey. It ensures that you will be spending hours at a time online, running around and contemplating your next move. The update was actually so motivating that I couldn't wait to get home from work the next day to continue playing. And that is a feeling that I haven't had in forever. It's also the first time I've experienced servers so overcrowded with players that the game kept crashing. And mind you, the Norwegian servers are usually dead. One thing that I will say though is that I'm kind of concerned that they are overusing Hollow Woods at this point. Again, it's the magic aspect of things and I'm kind of concerned that Hollow Woods will turn into Wild Woods because there are fireflies all over the place, there are magic horses, there's gonna come a unicorn next week. And I'm kind of concerned with the development of that whole thing. I do wish that you could turn the fireflies on and off at will. Uh, I do understand that it may be impractical to turn them off because you will collect the fireflies if you run through the woods. So that's a practical reason to always have them on. But for aesthetical reasons and for the atmosphere of the woods, I would actually like to turn them off at times. Now, that isn't enough to take away from the update of Hollow Woods as an area, because the update of the area itself is flawless and I love it so much. But I just want to add that as a side note that I'm kind of concerned about how magical it becomes. So honestly, the Hollow Woods update still does get a 10 out of 10 for me, because it just looks that good. So overall, I'm positively surprised by the things that have come out lately. The storyline is getting darker, the gameplay is getting more challenging, and they seem to put in more effort to preserve original lore and designs. This is not something that I was expecting, like, at all. And sure, there are still things that I dislike, and I don't agree with all the choices that are being made, but I am seeing a trend here. The fresher the update is, the more likely am I to enjoy it. 
I may dislike the Dark Riders and stuff that came out like a year and a half ago, but the more recent updates for the most part blow me away. I also want to add that I was surprised by the amount of things that have been added. It took me weeks just to catch up with the quests, and there seemed to be something new to check out around every corner. Overhaul championships, new races, areas, characters, new game functions, new loading screens, soundtracks. It was almost like experiencing the game for the first time again, because there were suddenly so many new things I had to learn. So does this mean that I am happy with the current state of the game, and am I pleased with how it's uh, turning out, and am I going to start playing again? Well, I do find myself wanting to go online more often, I think... Uh, I think on average this past few weeks and months I've been online for two or three days a week or so, which is more than I have been in a very long time. So I definitely do feel more motivated to play because I have more of a reason to go online now, but I do feel like the beef that I have with the main story being too magical and child friendly now and the trust issues that I have developed over time with the company and where it's going and everything they kind of are ingrained in my brain and they're, they're lying in the back of my head still. And I am not sure if I will be able to get as invested as I once was because of those things. So I'm definitely keeping my eyes peeled for where the things are going and I'm definitely gonna go online every once in a while. But I'm not entirely sure how it's gonna pan out in the long term. So to conclude, we don't really know if this trend of good quality content is going to continue into the long term or if it's just a one-off thing. And I also think that my long-term beef with the main story and the company um, kind of prevents me from getting as engaged as I once was. But I am feeling much more optimistic than I have in a very long time. And that's certainly something. So dear Star Stable, if you do happen to be watching this, keep up the good work because in the grand scheme of things, it's not looking too shabby right now. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, if you did, I'll see you around. Bye!